guys like movies? Yeah? This time of year, when they start talking about the Oscar nominations, I want to see all the best pictures. I'm interested in why, what made these the best, you know? I get excited about movies and films. When Lori gave me this scripture for today, about three weeks ago, I read it over, I read it over, and I'm thinking to myself, what, what is it here that I'm supposed to bring here? What is it here I'm supposed to bring here? And I started to get excited about the scripture because I picture it kind of like a movie. When we think about Jesus in this scripture in the fourth chapter of Luke, we have to remember that we have an idea of who Jesus was. We know Jesus as the, the minister, the healer, the one who boldly spoke where, wherever he went, that we know who he is. But the people in our scripture today, they know Jesus a completely different way. These are the people he grew up with. Jesus comes back home to Nazareth. As an adult, Jesus lived in Capernaum, where he practiced carpentry. He is a very ordinary man from a small village. Suddenly, people are starting to hear about him. So I can only imagine what the folks in Nazareth were thinking. Why, what is all this buzz about Jesus? That's just Joseph and Mary's kid. Why, why are we hearing about him through the whole countryside? So Jesus comes to Nazareth. It says it was his custom. It's like he went to church, just like it's our custom. He read from the scripture, just like Megan did today. Nothing out of the ordinary yet. They hand him the scroll, and he reads. Now, Jesus doesn't just pick from the Old Testament prophecy randomly. In fact, we know he takes from different parts in Isaiah and puts all together in his very first sermon. That's what we have today, his very first sermon. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then ordinary becomes extraordinary because then Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled. It's me. That's what he's saying. This is the big reveal. He's saying, we have heard about this Messiah prophesied in Isaiah our whole lives. We've heard about this for centuries. Today, this is being fulfilled. The whole crowd went nuts. We didn't read further into this, but at first, they were crazy about him. Then he said a few more things that ticked them off, and they weren't so crazy about him. And we have this group of people who think about Jesus in a certain way, and he challenges that. He challenges that with his sermon. Has that ever happened to you, church, where you think maybe somebody doesn't have the right perspective of who you are? You are coming to help or give some kind of good news, maybe, and people don't know who you are. They don't know, or they have an old idea of who you are, maybe. This did happen to me. This made me think about this. A few years ago, I used to work at the United Methodist Children's Home in Mount Vernon, and I was basically the chaplain there. One of my jobs, or one of my roles, was to speak at different Methodist churches in a pretty wide region. So I never knew where I was headed. I just kind of got in my car on Sunday mornings and drove sometimes a few hours and got to meet a bunch of new Methodist people. Well, this particular Sunday, it wasn't long before, you know, I pulled up to a church that was actually very similar to ours, an old stained glass window, beautiful church, and I got to introduce myself to a few people, and suddenly I saw a very familiar face, and I'm nowhere near anywhere I've ever lived, okay? I'm far away, and I see this, this lady, and her name was Anne, and Anne was my freshman dorm residential advisor. So she was the boss on our freshman dorm. And church, I'm just being honest with you, when I was a freshman in college, nobody was asking me to speak at churches, okay? <laughs> I'm just being honest that when Anne saw me as the prospective speaker, 
she did not see me as the person who should be the prospective speaker that morning. So I hadn't seen her in 10 years, and I kind of apologized for my shenanigans and try to tell her, you know, I'm a different person now, and this is my new life. And Jesus definitely did not have to apologize to anybody in his old church. We know that. But he had to overcome that perspective. How, how were they seeing him? And he just blew it out of the water. He, he said, this is my moment to shine. This is my most powerful sermon. This is my message. So his message wasn't just for them. It's for us. Who, who is Jesus not according to Nazareth, not according to us. Who is Jesus according to him? He is the anointed one. He is the chosen one. He is the savior. He was prophesied about before he was ever born. He has come because he is to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to recover sight for the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus is the anointed one, and this is what he's come to do. In order for us to hear this message the way we're supposed to, to know Jesus for who he really is, we have to look at ourselves in a different way. Raise your hand if you need Jesus, if you know you need Jesus. Okay, I think we all raised our hands. If we are mentioned in this scripture, who are we? Are we the poor? Are we the captives? Are we the blind? Maybe we are and we don't even know it. To what are we held captive? I think is an important question to think about from this scripture. If Jesus is here to set us free, what is it from? What is holding you or chaining you? to your old ways. I can tell you that when I was a freshman in college, there were different things <laughs> that were chaining me to a lifestyle that wasn't productive for God and his kingdom. And there's even things today that hold me captive. I know you guys have literally seen my struggle with food, especially sugar. I, I have got to be a sugar addict. <laughs> and you've seen me change over time because I struggle with this. I am bound, I am captive to this problem in my life, and I want to be free of it. So I read this scripture, and I have hope. Jesus didn't say, you know, if you sin, you are judged. That's not what he's saying here. He's not saying, get it right. Hold, hold yourself and your life to these standards. He's saying, I already know you're not going to. I already know you are not free. I've come to set you free. So it's our job to really look at ourselves and say, is it anger? Am I tied to anger? Is it shaping me into the person that I am? Am I tied to bitterness or resentment? Have I not forgiven someone in my life? Am I holding on to um, something that someone else did to me? You, you guys are way more familiar with your personal soundtrack. You know in your heart what you need to be set free from. And Jesus is telling you and he's telling me today that we can have that freedom. My favorite part of this whole scripture is when Jesus says he's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I'll tell you, the first time I read that, I had no idea what it meant. I I just thought, the year of the Lord's favor, okay, those are kind of just words to me. I don't know what he's talking about. So I started doing more research, and immediately I remembered. The year of the Lord's favor refers to the Jubilee year. Now, in the Old Testament, we have all these laws in Leviticus and Numbers. And one of the laws, out of the 600 plus, was that there was a festival, a party. God made rules about parties. I feel like Pastor Ed right now, because that's, that's how I met Pastor Ed. He said, we have a God that partied. <laughs> and we do. So this festival happened every 50 years in the Old Testament. Every 50 years, there was a jubilee. What that meant was, let's say I owed Linda money, okay? I owe Linda a lot. She has been generous to me, 
And over the past several years, I've been paying her back as I can, but I still owe her a tremendous amount. The Jubilee year means that all debts have been wiped clean. So Linda would come to me and say, even though you still owe, it's over. Your debt has been paid. And I was kind of telling Dave, my husband, this, this story, and just, I love it. I love the Jubilee year. I love that you get to start on a fresh page. And he was like, yeah, but what about the people who needed the money? <laughs> what about them? And it never crossed my mind, honestly. I just thought, oh, yeah, everybody's free. And he said, but what about them? So I kind of did some more research. And what it said was, the rich and the powerful, they always find a way to get theirs. The poor are always at a disadvantage. So God leveled the playing field. Once every 50 years, it wasn't unreasonable. It was just something incredibly not deserved, but just given for free. So when Jesus says he's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, I know what he's saying. He's saying, your debt, it's paid. Everything that you think you owe, you don't. You're free. And you can live like somebody who's free. So I think each of us, what we should take from the scripture today is first and foremost, knowing who Jesus is. Jesus is not some guy who lived a long time ago and said nice things. Jesus is the Messiah. He was promised long ago and he fulfilled the prophecy. He came to give us freedom. So we not only remember who Jesus is, but we remember who we are. What is it that's holding us back from the life we are supposed to be living? What is holding us captive? And finally, to know that this isn't a condemning sermon. This is a hopeful sermon. That the freedom is completely, fully available and ready today if we submit to it. And we say, look, I am humble enough to say I mess up all the time and I need this freedom, and I'm going to grab it. So I hope we all take that to heart, including myself. Amen.